I'm Mike Meese, and I have the honor of standing with America's last wild, genetically free wild bison um, for the last 22 years. What's important about the herd is that it is a real herd and a wild herd. They are the caretakers of our continent. They, when they walk, they eat the grasses, they spill the seeds, their hoofs are cleft, so they till the soil, and of course the magic fertilizer coming out of the back end, they replenish this earth with every walk, every step they take. And by holding them in such confined areas, we're limiting their ability to, to cleanse and heal this earth. They perform a function that this earth needs to keep in harmony. We need to change a lot of things in this world, and I think the buffalo can help teach us how to make that change and be a part of it with us. They're going to migrate because that's what buffalo do. And so it's kind of just a screwed up system, and a lot of the tribes are signing on to it because they've been told... This is the only way you'll ever get bison. So they're not happy with the way things are going, but a lot of times they're signing on because they're given ultimatums that this is the only way it will ever happen. And so that's, I hope I answered your question. So on the reservations then, there's an expectation that the bison will still be fenced. Yes. Okay. And poor Bill Knapp, they... um, Yeah. That's what I read about. Yeah, they um, they built this five, half a million dollar quarantine facility. And they said, okay, we have it, we're ready. Then the livestock department and APHIS, Animal Health Inspection Service, said, oh, we can't transport buffalo to your reservation because that's out of this designated surveillance area. But yet the hypocrisy was... And, they, and the natives called them on it. It's like, well, wait a minute, Aphis. You carted experimental laboratory test bison down to Fort Collins, Colorado, to do your experiments. So how come you were allowed to cart live bison and we're not? And now they're starting to change it, and they're going to let it be a phase three of the quarantine. So they're finally getting into it. But, I mean, it's just jumping through hoops and this... You know, we work, I work with a lot of tribes. We're actually trying to put together a Buffalo Summit for all the treaty tribes this summer. And my philosophy is in all of these treaties, and they're not, this isn't verbatim, but you will be allowed to hunt buffalo on unclaimed lands for time memorial in this area. Um, Unclaimed lands are the definition of Federal lands that are open to everybody, i.e. our national forest, BLM land, um, not state lands, but just that. And so we have this designated surveillance area that's allowed to have disease elk in it, which is gigantic. Why aren't the buffalo allowed? But more importantly, is this a violation of your treaty rights for them not allowing the land the bison to access the land and so that's going to be a big debate at our tribal summit this summer and hopefully you know there's been very much apprehension for a tribe individually to want to go out and fight the government because they would be setting a precedent for all the other treaty tribes so that's what I'm trying to do is bring them all together and go in as a unified, we are all the treaty right tribes of the buffalo, and we, you know, so hopefully that'll get some legs. Yeah. But <clears throat> So at this point, I um, just kind of want to share this goofy story. I kinda, I've been at this for, geez, 22 years since we started this group, and I was documenting the bison for about four or five years before that, before I helped start this group. And we were about 15 years into the campaign, right? And it was summertime, the buffalo had migrated back into the park, and I was just really going through a heavy time of self-reflection. And, you know, are we making any difference? I've been doing this for 15 years. They're still killing buffalo, and nothing seems to be changing. Do do the buffalo even know I'm trying to help them? Is there any, you know? And it's really in self-doubt. And traditionally, in the summertime, 
is the one time that all the buffalo unite again for their rut season, which happens in late July, early August, and they all go back into the park to their rutting grounds, and and that's when they're all out of the park and, and into a, a place where um, they're safe and they're all united. And so it's kind of rare for us to see a buffalo out where we live, which is eight miles outside of Yellowstone Park. And it was July 2nd. And out of the hills from right above our, um, our house down here in the other house area, this big bull buffalo just drops down, comes walking into our yard, and for um, about 12 and a half years, I lived year-round in a teepee in West Yellowstone, Montana. Um, all my native friends would come and tease me and say, you know, we had enough sense to migrate out of this ecosystem <laughs> in, the, in the winter months. And I was like, yeah, but I kind of cheat. I got this giant wood-burning stove in my teepee. And, and so finally, I guess I just admitted we were going to be at this for a long time, and I moved into one of our cabins. So this buffalo, of all the places it could have gone in the entire Yellowstone ecosystem, comes right up to my house, walks to the side of it, and beds down under this tree right outside of my kitchen window. I'm like, holy, what a sign. I, I guess the buffalo do know what I'm doing. This is great. <laughs> and then as... Um, the plot continues, we started to understand the story. And up from where the buffalo had just walked down, we started to witness these three different law enforcement officials drive up to this house. First on the scene was Montana Department of Livestock in their car. Second on the scene was our local Fish, Wildlife, and Parks officer. And last on the scene was Gallatin County Sheriff. And they have a little talk up there on the hill, and then they all dispersed. And the fish and game officer started driving up our driveway. And I know him pretty good. I've known him for many years. And so I walk out to meet him so he doesn't drive up by my house and see this buffalo. And he, I was like, hey, Jim, what's going on? What are you doing in my yard? And he's like, oh, Mike. Have you seen a rogue bull buffalo anywhere? I was like, why, Jim? What's going on? And he's like, you know that lady up on the hill, and not many of us in the community know her, but we all know her little annoying chihuahua dog that has a serious case of a Napoleon complex, and it unfortunately attacks anything bigger than it which is almost everything. And so in this naivety of this poor little chihuahua, it decided to take on a 2,000-pound bull buffalo. Well, let's just say this little chihuahua learned how to fly. <laughs> it did not get killed for any of you chihuahua lovers out there, um, but we'll just say it got rather humbled. And so Jim said, so, Mike, have you seen this rogue bull buffalo? And I said, yeah, Jim. It came walking through our yard, and it kept going down the alley, and if you go down there, you just might find him. So he goes back, radios, all the other law enforcement there driving down the valley, look like mad hornets and three cop cars going through everyone's backyard, peeking through windows, looking everywhere for this rogue bull buffalo. So about two and a half hours went by, and... Finally, they gave up, and we watched them all drive away. And not five minutes later, this big bull gets up, walks to my front yard, leaves me a little present to remember him by, out the back end, and migrates down Valley, where I had said he'd gone. Well, it was around the 4th of July, a lot of time my blood family will come up and my nieces and nephews come and we're in the big 4th of July parade and I don't know if you've seen that giant buffaloon. We put that on a trailer and we have a float in the local parade and educate people. So my parents and my family start arriving and the sun's going down and right as they're arriving, this big bull buffalo comes walking right through our yard up the hill, right directly to where said Chihuahua incident occurred. So we get a little nervous. They're going to come out and shoot this guy. I grab my video camera. All my nieces and nephews behind me, I look like Mama Duckling with all these kids, and we go up there to stand guard for this buffalo until the sun comes down. 
Because we know no matter how crazy these guys are, when the sun's down, they're not going to offload a high-powered rifle in the middle of a housing area. So the sun went down, and everything was good. Well, the next morning, we had to know what was going to happen with this guy. So we're up early in the morning, and this big bull had migrated about a mile and a half back towards Yellowstone into this area known as Red Canyon. And out comes Department of Livestock on his ATV yeah. and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks on his horse. And they're trying to push this buffalo around the canyon so they can shoot it with no one seeing it. Well, on this particular day, this big bull buffalo was having none of it. And he ran between the ATV and the horse that kept running. He ran across Highway 287, ran into the Holiday RV parking lot and disturbed a couple picnickers, <laughs> jumped into Hemkin Lake, swam across, ran up Horse Butte, and has never been seen again <laughs> to this day. So that is a true buffalo story. Oh, <laughs> but, it, you know, it's kind of like what I say. People like us that work for not out of the things for our own selfish greed, but hopefully to leave a better place for future generations on this planet, we get blessed with the magic. And, uh, and just spirits come to us and magical things happen to us all the time. And I just took that sign as, as just so meaningful, you know, in a time when you're depressed, really questioning your efforts, and then you have a big bull buffalo come visit you in the yard. Needless to say, that perks you up a bit. Yeah. So, it sounded like a smart buffalo, actually. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it was, he knew how to avoid his... Yeah, exactly. That's how they get to be older, right? You gotta get a little of that wisdom. But I, you know, and when we think about, I right before I came here, I was um, at a different conference. But at the same time, in Missoula, Montana, they had the International Wildlife Film Festival going on, mm -hmm. and they had this brilliant film that I had the honor of watching called um, "The Serengeti Rule." And it talks about science and how we kind of have it all backwards. Like, we're studying ecosystems completely on the soil content. And then the pyramid kind of comes up and we go to ungulates and then the predators are way up here. When really a lot of the science that these guys were researching is ecosystem degradation comes most often when the predator-prey balance or the keystone species are removed from that equation. Right. And he did this brilliant study, um, started out with this guy in your neck of the woods around here, um, coastal experiment, where he the only place he could have a controlled environment was, were in these tide pools. And so he went into these tide pools and he removed the starfish because they were the predators in the ecosystem of the tide pool. And at the time, they said there were, I think there were 37 different species that lived in these tide pools. And once he kept removing the starfish, it went down to one, the sea wow. urchins, because they were the most dominant ones and they ate everything else of the ecosystem. Wow. And then... They went and brought it, you know, there was all these different places. And then they went to the Serengeti, where they had a disease outbreak. I forget the name of the disease, but they had to kill down their wildebeest to, I think, a quarter of a million animals from million, uh, over a million. And they killed them down to that. And then their population started to grow back and grow back and grow back every year. And it got up to a million and a quarter animals and all the scientists were like, oh, my God, they're going to ruin the plains. They're going to overgraze it. But what they witnessed was the wildebeest was the keystone species for the entire ecosystem out there. And that their po population plateaued at a million and a quarter. And all the giraffes came back. The zebras came back because they incubate and fertile, or fertilely plant this ecosystem with their every move. And that the predators play a role in keeping them in check and keeping them moving. And, you know, I've always said this gift about the buffalo is their natural ability to take care of the earth. Like, 
that in people's private houses, they'll go in and they'll eat all the invasive species plants that are non-native to the area. They'll kill them and they'll piss the locals off. But that's part of their gift. I'll see the same herd migrate through an area every year. And they won't stay in overgraze. They'll spend, you know, a day or two or two weeks, and then they'll migrate through that area. And when the buffalo come through an area, of course, they're eating the grasses and spilling the seeds. Their hoofs are cleft, and so they, when they walk, they till the soil. And then, of course, you got the magic fertilizer coming out the back end, and you have a perfect regeneration. And they do that because they know next year when they come back to that area that it's been planted and taken care of and there'll be grass for future generations and that's how they exist. And you think of it in a historical perspective on this continent, you know, that we all hear the myths of the great grasslands on the prairie, 14 foot tall. Well, this was the same time when we had 30 to 60 million buffalo and annually, a herd of a million would march through that area, groom it down, eat a bunch of it, replant it, retill the soil, leave, come back next year, and the 14-foot tall grasslands were there again because they had been taken care of. They had been gardened, or however you want to put the perspective, and they don't exist anymore because we don't have buffalo there anymore. And a lot of the other ecosystem parts, prairie dogs, and everything that's symbiotic to, to make it work. When I was there with you 20 years ago, you taught me that the buffalo do not eat the grass down to the ground. They eat it so that it grows better, but they don't. They're like on the grass. They, they, they continue to grow the grass. And that was something that you taught me that I did not know before I got there. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, think of it, you know, it's like Rosalie always used to say that the animals know their place, they know their job on this earth, and they do it. We're the ones that are out of whack. No, We've forgotten what our role is in this ecosystem. And now we're the dictators of the ecosystem. And it's just, you know, we, we don't, that's just like I said on this panel I was on a few minutes ago. It's like wildlife management is an oxymoron. Yeah. It needs to be human management. The animals don't need our help. They know what they're doing. We're the ones that are out of place and off track. And if we, you know, it's like, I don't have a degree in biology or anything, but I sit and watch buffalo all the time. And they teach me things, you know. I, I truly think animals have a way of correcting, or if we never give them the reverence to learn from. You know, it's like in the buffalo world, they have leaders, mainly the, the lead mamas, the big females. They take care of the entire herd. But their job isn't to be the most famous or to get the most money. They have the burden of making sure that everyone in that herd is taken care of and survives. Because in a buffalo world, we're all the same. We're equal. And it matters, you know, every single buffalo in their circle matters just as much as the lead buffalo. And they make sure each other survive. You watch them in the thick winter snows of Montana's winters, taller than my head. And they walk single file through that big burdening snow. And when the head buffalo that's leading the pack gets tired, he or she steps to the side, lets the entire procession go by, and then they jump in at the end where it's easy and the, the work is done and it's easy to walk. And so they share the burden of survival with all of them. They take care of one another, you, you know? And then to think of like Native Americans and how their cultures resemble, like for instance, you might have been to a powwow. I know they call them something different on the West Coast here. Well, um, Jubilee, maybe? Do they call them that? Pawatch. Pawatch, that's it, yeah. But the... 
they have this dance called the round dance. And all the elders will be in an outer circle and they'll put all the kids in the middle. And that's mimicking what a buffalo does when predators come around. Mm -hmm. They get a circle of adults and they put their babies in the middle so that they can protect them. And, you know, just the, everything they do is about all of them. It's about existence of everyone. And if we can start to think like that as humans, you know, I think we could really... I mean, it seems I've never seen our country in such disarray with utter hatred for one another. And, you know, we have leaders that are instigating that division and making sure it gets stronger and more. And, you know, it's like we share this planet together. And if we're going to hate each other and fight, we're never going to cure anything, you know. And I've always said, too, like, kind of in, in science fiction movies, they, they have what I think is something we need to look at a little bit stronger. But you notice in every science fiction movie you ever watch, we're always referred to as earthlings. <laughs> and until we grasp that concept, that all of us on this big round ball share this big round ball, and it doesn't matter what you do over there, because it does affect me over here. And, you know, I'll never forget one of my favorite places to go is Newport Beach in Oregon. And um, after Fukushima, one of the docks washed up on the shore in, in, in Newport, Oregon. And to me, that's just like, everything is connected, and we're just so disconnected. And, and you know, if we just sit, watch, and listen, and learn, I think a lot of this natural world and not natural wildlife have a lot of answers to cure what ails us and, and have the teachings to show us the right way. We just got to, as Rosalie used to say, get our ear swabs out and clean out our ears and listen. So. Yeah. Well, I want to know what you think of the monster beefalo then. I mean, if we're all connected. <coughs> so many of these beefalo as part of the body of some population. Like, what's the potential for those to play a role in ecosystem restoration or, uh, I don't know, fresh foods or whatever it is. I mean, you know. Well, I mean, that they're hybrids. here. So many of us are hybrids. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're, I mean, there aren't any really pure of us anymore. We've all been mixed throughout the world. Um, I think they all have their place, you know. At this point, it's not like, you know, what are you going to do? with the 40 million cows that took the buffalo's place essentially on this continent, you know? We gotta kinda weigh out what we wanna do with this place first. I mean, the cows I, I look at as an invasive species. They're non-native, their hoofs are not cleft, they compact the soil, and a cow will eat every blade of grass right there, take one step, eat every single blade of grass, you know what I mean? They don't. They're not here to protect the ecosystem, but we we are in charge of them. We manage them, and there are people making very valiant efforts to rotate pastures to use them in that healing way, and I think that these beefalo could be done the same way, but you're going to get the same result if you have a factory farm, no matter what species you have on that factory farm, because it's it's not natural. It's not how the earth is meant to handle animals or vice versa, you know? So, I mean, we have to change our ways and work with what we got. But when you're talking about the wild ones and the uniqueness of those and the importance to preserve and protect them, that's what I focus my work on is, is being in touch with the wild, making sure that there is a wild element left and the rest of them, you know, whatever, we're already managing. We are, that's up to us to make a conscious decision to want to, to want to do that in a better way. But the natural world, I just think we got to get out of its way, give it what it's asking for, and let it come back and teach us more about how to survive on this little round ball we live on. My two cents. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there there's many different ways we could take this on in, in a different approach, you know? We just got to want to, or, right. you know, it's just, 
we, you know, we were talking about earlier today about <clears throat> just, um, oh, pesticides and all this stuff that's getting into our food and how come everyone doesn't buy organic? And it's like, because most of us can't afford organic food. It's kind of elitist the way it is now. That should be standard procedure. There should not be any other variation than organic food. That should be our norm, our standard. But as long as we're going to have the class wars, then our food diet of very good things is restricted to just these elite people. And that's what we've got to change, is we just have to say, sorry, there's a natural way to do this, a right way to do this, and there's a wrong way to do this. You know, one last thing, and then I'll come on with this, otherwise I'll forget. But it's kind of like, I, um, I like to do a lot of things myself. I don't like to have to buy stuff. I, I'd rather do everything I can on my own. But what we've labeled as a culture, what I call lifelong skills, they call primitive skills. Because it gives it that nasty condensation that really... All primitive skills are is me knowing how to take care of myself without needing you to do it for me. And so as long as we, we put things like that with that stigma, we also talked, I had a little talk earlier, and I'm sorry to delay your question, but um, it's kind of like, in my honest opinion, you know, we're having this new wave of great, brilliant, young, vibrant women that are taking over our Congress and Senate, and it's long overdue, to say the least. But we have to understand prejudice and, and the general public. Like, it's easy for me to sit here around a bunch of like-minded people, preach to the converted, and feel good about myself. What's not easy to do is change the world against people that really don't think very much of you and think you're trying to tell them how to live. And then they come up with this thing called the Green New Deal. And it's, you know, I mean, common sense. But the word green has been tarnished. It kind of drives a line amongst our society now that, oh, I don't want to be with them goddamn pinko liberal lefties. I don't want anything green. And I don't know if it's Al Gore that blew that for us or whatever, but the Green New Deal is going to automatically, just by its name, put people on one side of the fence or not. Now, if we were to label this our children's future New Deal, might catch a little more people <laughs> because everyone has children. Everyone wants them to have a future. And that would hook more people that aren't on our side already. Because I love our movement and everything, but we waste too, way too much time preaching to the converted and not converted the people that really would be with us if we could find the way to deliver the message in the right way. And so I always think of that words have meaning. And you got to think about how one word can make people you know, already be divided. And that's the kind of world we're in right now, I think. So you had a question. I'm sorry, I delayed it long. <laughs> um, has anybody studied uh, what it would take, or if it's even possible, to restore the tall grass prairies if we were to start wanting to do that? Um, there's a, a group in Montana, eastern Montana, the, the Great Prairie Reserve, and they're trying to bring back buffalo and running into every problem, but it's all part of that prairie restoration kind of philosophy. I don't think it's been done enough, but believe me, in Montana, those guys are running into so many problems just trying to have wild bison back there, and they're they're beefalo. They're not even wild bison, and they won't even let them roam. And so, I mean, it's we're just so combated with this capitalistic, greed-oriented people that, you know, I think that that was one of my original attractions more than anything to Native American and Native American culture was the fact that their philosophies are based on what do my actions today 
have a consequence on seven generations down the road. Our system is set up so that we cannot have future vision. We have an election cycle either every two years or every four years. And people, one year after they're into their job, they're so worried about getting reelected, they're not doing anything. In the, and so we never have, you know, someone on the panel said something, we need to, to think like we're going to live here for 500 years. We can't just think in these little incremental pockets of, you know, we have to have a bigger world vision of time and space and breathability because we're just... Nothing, no one cares about our future because they're not going to be here then. And, you know, we have all these old white men making decisions that are going to affect all our youth, and, and they never ask the youth how they feel about it. And that's what I really like about this conference is there's a wide diversity of, of age and color and people, but I, that's what we need to get together to make change. You know, is, is I don't know much about what I call Facebook McMe pages and you know I don't know that world very much because it doesn't interest me in the least but that's a tool that reaches so many people in so many ways and so that's a perfect balance of where the younger people can teach the older people and it's a, a sharing of knowledge both ways so it's not just the teaching philosophy we're all going to do this but you know it's it's us sharing and integrating both of our minds to get the best end product for the thing we're fighting for. And, and that kind of thing, I think, is real important. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. I battled a lot of <laughs> There is like a like holistic management. Have you heard of Alan Savory? Yeah. His work, that's like all I can think of when I think of like restoring grasslands and stuff like that, besides obviously rewilding. The ecosystem, I guess, like through intensive holistic management of grazing, you can restore at least they like the soil level of what maybe used to be to an extent. Right. Yeah. But I mean, how do we, you know, we go into a forest and we clear cut it, <clears throat> and then we have our feel good people go out and plant trees, but they plant a monocrop of the preferred conifers that are best for milling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, once we destroy a forest, how could we ever put it back together when we really don't even know everything that was in it that we destroyed in the first place because we haven't taken enough time to stand back, observe, and learn and receive the gifts that we were all given, you know? So, I mean, Mother Nature is going to clean this earth. And to me, I can feel her telling us, you better change or I'm going to do something. I mean, I always say one of the biggest cleansers of the earth is where I live. If the Yellowstone caldera goes off, the entire world will not see the sunshine for over a year. And I can finally say, y'all can kiss my ash. <laughs> Sorry, I've been waiting to say that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, whether we do it or not, as a human species that cares enough to be compassionate enough about our kids' futures, Mother Nature's going to cleanse this place again, and we'll start with the tadpoles again, you know, or whatever you believe, you know. So, I mean, it, it, I just love that, that there are a lot of people, especially in this divided time, our country is, is on the brink of who knows what. You know, there's hate, utter hatred, I could, you know, between us. And really, if, if we can find that common block between us, and I think that block is, what are we going to leave our kids? You know, that's something that we all have. It's something we can all relate to. I don't have any, but I read about it. Um, at any rate, um, you know, just we got to hit, we got to quit using our words to convert them to, you know, Use their words that have meaning to them, that open it up so it's not just as such a cut and dry, you're on this side of the fence or not, you know. And I think most people know things are out of balance and they would admit that. And But, you know, one thing too, and, and I'm guilty of it too, but I always try and remind myself is Mike 
Be a teacher, not a preacher. Nobody wants you to tell them how to live, how to be, how to walk, how to talk. But if you got to find common ground and you can share in a learning experience together and let them be part of the solution as well, then I think you can create the change we're all hoping for. But, you know, I often sit in lectures and I'm told how I'm supposed to live or I'm a bad person. And it's it kind of, it's hard for me to swallow too. It's like, and so that's one lesson I always give. It's like, if you want to be an environmentalist, the first thing you got to say is, I'm a hypocrite. Because none of us can live the right way right now. It's just not possible. We all probably got here by fossil fuel or by some form, you know what I mean? So don't go into it like you're smarter than people, you're better than people. We're all locked in this paradox and we're all going to break out of this box together. And so the more we can find commonality, the more we can get this unity and, and get back on track. Because I think most people really do understand that things aren't like they used to be. And that we could have something a lot better and share it with all of us instead of just the one percenters. So... Is everyone depressed enough now? Or <laughs> no, I'm joking. But these things are what make us have a little change and hope, you know, that we're not alone in this battle. And another thing, too, is never let them tell you you can't do something. You know, all my life, people, oh, you can't start. There's already groups watching the buffalo and protecting them. You can't start another group. Well, they live in Bozeman and they compromise all the time. I'm not going to let them be the voice for the buffalo. I'm moving in with the buffalo and no one's going to tell me I can't do this. So don't ever let people put you down, get you off your heart's passion, and you can achieve anything you want to in this world. And, and everyone, each and every one of us lies that power to create change. And, and it's better to know we're not alone. But if we have to do it alone, if you look at the history of the world, it's always been a handful of people that start some change, and then everyone else joins in. So be that one person to start the change, because we sure as hell need you. So I'm going to show one last little 30-second, we call it our empowerment video. That's providing I can get this damn thing to work again. Might need my genius friend up there in the front. And this one's a 30 second little trailer, but I'm gonna set this one up. So, for you guys that endured my babbling today, I have a few gifts. I don't know if you've been to our table, but anyone that would like one, we have these beautiful, annually produced, as you might guess, it's a calendar. Um, this is also, I'm going to warn you in advance, this is a form of buffalo propaganda. <laughs> this is, this is going to make you think about buffalo 365 days a year. So take it with that warning in advance. But anyone that would like one of these or a couple to share with friends. Um, <clears throat> these stickers, everyone seems to like them. They're our attitude stickers, and I have little ones for free on our table. Um, but these are the big ones, and it's an attitude sticker. I'm a buffalo. I do what I want. <laughs> so if you want to grab one and pass this around, I'll just leave that stuck. And then um, so I'm going to leave on this note, unless ever other people have questions. Of course, I can't. My glasses aren't with me today. But our um, other co-founder, Rosalie Little Thunder, has passed away. 
about six years ago, and as I like to say, she now leads us from above. Um, but we have, I only have like four of these stickers, so anyone that wants them will have to grab them quick. Um, but I, I can't read this because my eyes aren't, don't work without glasses on midget text. Could you oh, read that, that sure. one? Remind yourself every morning, every morning, every morning, I'm going to do something. I've made a commitment, not for yourself, but beyond yourself. You belong to the collective. Don't go wandering off, or you will perish. <laughs> Rosalie Little Thunder, Dakota BFC co-founder. I got two more of those, so I... Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Is one left there? And then I have our generic ones of these. But the last thing um, I'd like to ask you guys is the reason... The reason this is going on is just like everything else. is because people just don't know about it. You know, we watch our store-bought media. You can um, watch whatever channel your political alignment aligns to. But in that process, we really forget to cover things that matter and, and affect our lives. And so I like to become my own distributor and my own news source in any way I can. So if any, every one of you guys could grab a little handful of these and give them out to friends, put them in a coffee shop, put them in doctor's office, any way you can think of. And um, as I like to say, spread the word to save the herd. Um, but that's what we have to be in this day and age, our own advocates, our own news sources, our own educators, our own uniters. And it's time for us to stand up and take that um, one chief that helped raise me and brought me up the way I am by taking me in and giving me trust, Tiny Man Heavy Runner, um, the chief of the Blackfeet Nation up in northern Montana and Canada. And um, he died one day, and I didn't even know. And that night he died, he came to me in a dream. And um, he said, Mike... It's time for us to become the leaders. And I'll leave you all with that. It's time you all became the leaders because the world needs this guidance right now. And it's our job to take that task on and do something about it. So I thank you for your time. And I'll answer any questions you have.